Hey, welcome to Columbine United Church Online for what might seem like the 800th week in a row, but we're actually at 51 weeks as we come up on one year of COVID starting to spread in our communities. Thank you for your patience, your flexibility as a church community. You have been awesome. I know this hasn't been easy, but if we've all learned one thing, maybe it's a little bit more patience, adaptability, and flexibility in the face of the unknown. So thank you for hanging in there with us. We are, as a church staff, already starting to think about when can we be back into our building that's been under renovation? Also, when can we start gathering and how can we start gathering outdoors and in person in smaller groups? So we will continue to update you as we make those plans moving forward. Our next big plan for gathering is Easter. Easter is the weekend of April 3rd and 4th. April 3rd, um, we will have a family Easter extravaganza, Easter egg hunt at 1.30 in the afternoon at Clement Park on Saturday, followed by a family service at 2.30. And then on Easter Sunday, which is April 4th at Clement Park Amphitheater, we will have a 9.30 and an 11 a.m. service. Um, you, let's see. We encourage you to bring flowers as we will be doing a flowering of the cross. And that's not as much cross contamination if you bring your own flowers. We'll also have some, but if you bring your own flowers, cut your stems to six inches and it'll be ready for them to be in the flowering of the cross. We also, of course, will have an identical online recorded service for those of you who um, are not able to be with us at the Clement Park Amphitheater. So we are hoping for uh, 55 degree weather like today when I'm recording this and no blizzards. So keep that in your prayers and we look forward to seeing you Easter weekend. As always, we send out a weekly e-blast that has all of the Zoom links for our Sunday morning education hour, our Sunday morning coffee hour where we just get to connect with one another faith forum and also bible other bible study zoom links if you'd like to get connected though please email us our office email is cuc at columbineunitedchurch.org that goes to natalie and we are happy to get you connected other updates on the building and our community life moving forward we just met with contractors and architect this morning over at the building and they are um, moving forward with just really exciting things as they finish building walls repairing too many plumbing leaks and um, getting ready to put the finishings of drywall and patching concrete and all that kind of stuff in the month of March. And then April and May will really be the aesthetics of putting back everything together. And so the rock wall in the sanctuary behind the cross, the beams are being put in, installing the um, elevator, and then all of the stuff of just the flooring and paint and kitchen appliances that they'll finish that stuff out as we look in May. They're looking towards wrapping up the end of May, early June. They will have a official occupancy date for us where we can start to move back in 45 days out. So I think probably the middle of April, we'll have a better idea of what our exact kind of move back in date is. We're also gonna do a building tour mid-April again on a Saturday where y'all can come and walk through the building and building tours and see the progress. So it is, a very exciting journey. It's an undertaking that we really couldn't do without the entire community supporting, trusting, and faith as we move forward. We truly are creating an updated, unified building that will serve us for decades to come. Um, it's been exciting. It's not really glamorous to update plumbing and electrical and conduit but it's all those things that needed to be brought up to the 21st century updated unified um, as we move forward so super excited thank you on that note thank you for all of you who continue to support the ministry the life the mission of columbine so many of you have switched to giving online and we really we really celebrate that thank you colorado public radio calls those their evergreen members the people that schedule 
giving every single month. That helps us at Columbine not have a, a huge giving in June and no income in July. Helps us a lot. And so um, we always encourage you to move your giving online and we are happy to help you with that if we um, can help you in automating it. Just let us know. Today, as we dive into the service, we're gonna start with a video from the work of the people, which speaks to today's scripture, which is Matthew 6 and the beginning of chapter seven. Do not worry and do not judge. And so enjoy this picture and music that invites us to sit with the scripture for a couple minutes.
Thank you, Joe and choir, for that beautiful choral call to worship. Just love it. Beautiful music. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the worship video. It's a Tuesday afternoon and the sun is out. It's a beautiful 50 degrees up here in Conifer, Colorado. I know you might be watching this on a Sunday where we're supposed to have the snow apocalypse. Boy, do we need the moisture, but a lot of snow. So I'm hoping that you're warm and cuddly someplace, maybe with a cup of coffee, because that's what I want you to do. You know, watching, watching a worship video, it's just, it's not like being together face to face, but it's what we have for right now. And so I want you to create a sacred space. Maybe light a candle, maybe open your Bible, maybe do something special for yourself that will say to you, this is a sacred time. I want you to take a breath. I want you to Picture the presence of God dwelling deep in your heart. And let us worship God. Samantha and kids have a great Lenten video for us. Hello, Columbine. It's me, Samantha, here to introduce to you our Lenten Dialogues. Today, we see a conversation happening in the kitchen of Mary and Martha as their good friend Lazarus, played by Kenna, is coming in to tell them the good news that Jesus is coming over. We have Mary and Martha being played by Elliot and Kayla. I hope you enjoy. groceries. But I have news, Martha. Jesus is back in town, and I'm sure he will be joining us for dinner. What? Jesus is back in town, and he's coming here tonight? And you took all this time so, so that we don't even have time to prepare a decent meal? What were you thinking? You have, you should have been come back immediately. We should be preparing our very best feast for him. Now, Martha, he won't care how fancy our food is. But look what I did yet. Oh, Mary, you didn't. That must have cost a fortune. Yes, but it's for Jesus. When will you learn, Mary? We have to be responsible. You have to think before doing these things. What if Lazarus and I weren't here? You'd be in the poorhouse, or worse. Take it back and get your money back. What will people think of your crazy spending? They'll take advantage of you and we'll lose everything. I'm not taking it back. Hello, Mary, Martha. Did you hear? Jesus is back in town and is coming here for dinner. Oh, I heard all right. And Mary has been spending all of our money rather than helping me prepare an appropriate meal. And there's something else. I heard rumors today. Rumors that the high priests want, that they're plotting to. Oh, it's too awful to even say. Now, Martha, you are worked up over nothing. I've, uh, I've heard the rumors, too. They don't like the miracles Jesus has done. They don't like anything they can't explain. Yes, and you are being alive are one of those miracles that they can't explain. I think they want to kill you. <laughs> oh, Martha, you worry too much. Why worry about the things that don't matter, like the money I spent today, or how perfect your dinner is? Your food is always good, and what matters is that we get to spend the evening listening to er, our good friend. <laughs> And the priest wanted to kill Lazarus? How outrageous is that? She already died and Jesus brought her back to us. Why should we ever fear death when Jesus is around? She is right, Martha. Hasn't he already shown us the, the miraculous things he can do and that he loves us? It is our love and friendship that he seeks, not your worries about some special meal or what other folks are thinking. Why should we be worrying about what other people think? My trust is in him. Come on, Martha, go heat up some soup that you have left over from yesterday, and we will spend the whole night listening to what Jesus has to say. Can you think of a better way to spend your time? Yes, Martha, don't you remember what Jesus said? Something about not being anxious for your life or for what you eat or drink or wear? Didn't Jesus say to seek the kingdom of God instead of worrying all the time? Exactly. Let us go greet our guests and seek the kingdom of God. <laughs> Easy for them to say, now I'm left alone to prepare a decent meal for who knows how many guests. Thank you, youth, for such a wonderful performance. We are so excited for all of your talents and how you share them with us. You can see Indy crawling up the stairs behind me. 
as we get ready to take a breath. As we take a breath, again, we're returning to the song that we played the last couple of weeks, where we think about returning again to who we are, to who we were created to be. Take a moment to rest in that. I just love that song. Isn't it ethereal and just uplifting? Ah, thank you. I want to read today's scripture before we head into our next song, which is called Dust I Am. What a perfect Lenten um, scripture that is. This Lent is this journey of humility, 
of understanding our own dusty and ashen natures. Today, we continue in our Sermon on the Mount series as we are looking at Matthew chapter 6 and the beginning of 7. The theme, as you already sort of experienced in the video, is do not worry and do not judge. So often at Columbine, we say we take scripture seriously, but not literally. But I think this is one of those places where Jesus would say, no, actually take me literally. Don't worry. Do not let your life be consumed with worry. The more we worry, the more our world becomes so small and consuming. We tend not to worry about others very much. We tend to worry about ourselves. Another part of the passage is do not judge. Literally, don't judge. When we judge, we put ourselves in a place of divine standing above everyone else, being little gods or kings and queens um, with our edicts over other people. Jesus says, don't judge. Leave that to God in heaven, who we trust is above, and we will let be above all things. So here now the scripture, as we... Um, get to hear one more song before the sermon. I've got to bring up my scripture here. So this is Matthew 25, Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any, can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your lifespan? And why do you worry about clothes? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will God not, not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore don't worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows what you need in all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God, in God's right ways. And all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Continuing in Matthew 7, Jesus says, Do not judge others so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get.
So today we continue in our discussion of the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' words. We're going to wrestle with the idea of do not worry and do not judge others. So you may think that worry is just kind of a part of our nature, part of our society. You may feel like it's part of your DNA. I think worry, um, what we can worry about has for sure been elevated during COVID. What we thought we worried about, well, now there's a whole nother level of worries, especially for all of us who would maybe think of ourselves as germaphobes. I love this quote about worry that is in a uh, Baz Luhrmann song. I don't know if you know Baz Luhrmann, but he wrote a song that's kind of a poem in a song. But he says, don't worry about the future or worry. Because, but know that worry is about as effective as trying to solve an algebra equation by chewing bubblegum. The real troubles in your life are apt to be the things that never crossed your mind to worry. The kind of things that blindside you at 4 p.m. on some idle Tuesday. It's not so true about worry. If we're not worrying about one thing, we're worrying about another. And as soon as something comes up, then it changes our whole orientation about the next thing to worry about. This week, as I've been talking to people about worries, a couple of people have said, you know, my worries have changed so much over time. I don't think about the things at all that I worried about in my 20s, but I think about a whole different set. I wonder how much we live in a society that um, it's just, we live in a culture and an atmosphere of worry. Another way to think about worry is just anxiety and angst. I think it was Stephen Covey in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People who talked about um, scarcity mentality versus abundance mentality. It strikes me that what Jesus is talking about in so many parts of the Sermon on the Mount is how to live out the kingdom of God in a kingdom mentality that is all about abundance, that there is enough, that this world is overflowing with potential and goodness and love. And this creator that created this whole system will provide for the system that has been created and the creation, that being us. These are Jesus's words of abundance. Stephen Covey talks about the opposite being the mentality of scarcity. That if I give you something, it takes away from what I have. That there's not enough for everybody. That we have to fight over it. We have to fight for our place. I think scarcity mentality is very much the mentality of so much of our society and our world. It's what drives our competition. It what it's what drives the haves and the haves nots. And scarcity is so much um, this mentality that buys into the lie. That there's not enough and that this creator will not provide or has not provided enough for all of the creation. So Jesus challenges us saying, don't worry. Don't buy into the lie of scarcity. Scarcity leads to hoarding to death, scarcity, anxiety, worry. They snuff out joy, imagination, innovation, creativity, all these things that we are invited to live into. I think one of the other things that um, challenges us to um, walk away, like when we worry, we also are turning our backs on the invitation of Jesus to live in community. I think so much about when I am worried about things in my life, my world gets so small because I think it's all about me to provide or to make things happen. I realize that the bigger my life becomes with community, with neighbors, with others, I realize that God so often meets my needs through community. There's been times where our family, even our last move, we sold our house and we needed a place to live for like seven weeks. We had a neighbor that said, hey, move into our cottage. You can live there for seven weeks. It's totally fine. And you know what? The seven weeks in the cottage ended up being 
the greatest gift of a place for us to live. That I find that the gifts and God's provision come through community. So as Jesus talks about worry, not only does he say, hey, look out of the birds, God provides for them. But there's something about the birds that they live in a flock, that they're all together in it. And it's this reminder to step away from our fierce independence, which is so often driven by this scarcity mentality of, if I share my piece of the pie, it means I have one less for me, or that there might not be enough pieces of the pie, and step towards this idea of living in community, of trusting others, and trusting that there is enough. And in this trust of abundance, that we will see God's provision, not only through community, but you know what? You will be the way God provides for others. It's one of the gifts of being a pastor. You see over and over people in communities do extraordinary things, acts of kindness and generosity and love for other people, whether that's housing, whether that's childcare, whether that's walking with them through illness, finding a walker or a wheelchair as someone recovers. It is truly the gift of community where we are saved from a self-focus, a myopic self-focus on our self and our own needs and worrying about that and trusting that um, as we lean into community, God is with us. I love this quote in Brian McLaren's writings as he talks about this. Here it is. He says, as we think about living simply and choosing community, we realize that my own anxiety is more dangerous to me than whatever I am anxious about. Paul, in his writings in Philippians, is writing the book of Philippians in the end of his ministry life when he is in prison in Rome. And he writes these words about worry. Um, He writes them in I don't know, prison, and you can imagine what prison's like, but Roman prisons are actually like these holes in the grounds that are like these pits, and you were lowered in through a small hole and left in this horrible pit. So it's helpful to me to think about that context as I read these words. Maybe some of you have toured these places in Rome when you've been there down by the Colosseum. Paul's words, don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer, in supplication, like asking God with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. And he continues later in Philippians 4 verse 12 to say, I know what it is to have a little. I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and being of need. It is this. I can do all things in God who strengthens me. You can do all things. This presence and the power of God with us is the power to rise above this anxious society that we live in that would lead us to believe there's not enough for all. I've been reading a book called Failure of a Nerve, and it talks about how um, leadership in our families in our schools, in our society, is often the challenge of navigating through a highly anxious, nervous society or places. He talks about in this book that leaders have to step away from the anxious system and lead through that. He also talks, though, about how we have to do something different to step out of this constant style cycle of anxiety, reading more news, scrolling Facebook, more social media, doing the same thing we've always done is probably not going to help us wake up to this constant angst around us and worry. What does it mean in Jesus in the Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount? I don't have words today. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is calling people to step away from the world and what everybody else is doing, to be set apart, to pray, to fast, to 
contemplate. These are all the invitations to spiritual disciplines. What are the spiritual disciplines in your life that help you walk away from being consumed with worry and anxiety? Maybe it's prayer, maybe it's journaling, maybe it's reading or listening to podcasts that inspire you. Maybe it's meditation or yoga. Here's the thing. We have to do something intentional to step out of this current in the society that is extremely anxious. It's an intentional choice to be shaped by different things. Jesus say, says, be shaped by God in God's vision of this kingdom. Do not be conformed any longer to the ways of this world. You know, you may have heard the story, right, of the frog. The, fr the frog experiment is if you put a frog in warm water and turn up the heat under a pan, as it slowly comes to a boil, the frog will be boiled to death because it doesn't realize the heat is being turned up. On the other hand, if you have boiling water and you throw a frog into it, it sees instantly that it's boiling and that it will kill it and it jumps out. In so many ways, our society is um, boiling water. It's constantly being turned up around this toxic anxiety connected to scarcity and worry. And yeah, we have to do something intentional to wake up and to step out and to live differently. Jesus is saying, choose simply, choose love, choose community, walk away from the lies of scarcity and the toxic notion that there's not enough. Because in my father's kingdom, in my mother's kingdom, there's more than enough for all. Okay, so that's part one, worry. Then we've got a short moment on judging. Stay with me. So if we had one main point from do not worry, it is don't be a frog or don't be that frog. Wake up, jump out before it's too late. Do not let your life be ruled by worry, Jesus says. There's another way towards life because worry robs us from our joy. Then Jesus goes on to talk about judging, right? These are these, these inner word habits that maybe we think we can hide from others, but Jesus says, do not judge others for how you judge the measure you are judging others, you will be judged by. Brian McLaren says, this is ultimately about love. That if we understand our own belovedness is unique, amazing, divine creatures in the image of the divine, right? Then we don't have to criticize other people and judge them so harshly. The temptation to judge and to be critical is, I think, just exacerbated with media social media especially. We look at other people and their Facebook or their Instagram and their lives seem so ideal and beautiful, um, well organized. And yet there's this reminder that we really do not know what is going on in anyone else's lives, the struggles they have, their addictions, their places of mental illness, where they're discouraged. Maybe their families are falling apart. There's so many places, physically, emotionally, mentally, where we are broken. Jesus says, leave the judging up to God. For you are a child of God. Know that you are beloved and live in your place of belovedness. Live out of that. I think of the people in my life that I love to be around, the, the people that are filled with words of life, of grace, of generosity. They're the people that I can admit my faults to and be transparent with, because you know what? I know that they won't judge me harshly. On the other hand, we all have that friend who is so critical of everything and everyone and you know what? It is just like bug repellent that we know that those are who are critical of everything and other people, they're critical of us too. And in that criticism, there's no place for love, generosity, abundance, and growth. 
So leave the judging. Leave the judging to God or whoever else we're going to let judge. And be a people of grace. Be a people of mercy. Be a people of generosity. Brian McLaren says, after he says, my own anxiety is more dangerous to me than whatever I'm anxious about. He says, my own habit of condemning is more dangerous to me than what I deem in others. My misery is unnecessary ultimately because I am truly loved. Isn't it true that our worry and our judgment robs us of joy? Robs us of joy. And so I don't know where you are today. Maybe one of these topics you super resonate with and maybe you don't. You get to apply this to your own life and see where it connects with you. For me, one of the things I've been thinking about is what do I worry about? I've been trying to be really conscious of that in the last couple of weeks, just even thinking about this sermon. One of the things I've realized is every time I get in the car, I'm either blazing out of the house in a rush because I think I'm going to be late. Or once I get in the car, I'm trying to calculate and worry about how long it's going to take me to get to the next place. So much that I just feel stressed and tense. I know none of you feel this, but for me, I'm like, who's the crazy in front of me going 17 miles an hour? Ah! You know what my challenge is? Hey, chill out get in the car, take a deep breath, slow down and be present. And you'll be at your next place when you're at your next place. And you know what? Give yourself some grace. If you're late, be late, move on. For me, I realize that I have so much angst when I drive about how long it's going to take someone to get somewhere. I don't need that in my life. So my new spiritual discipline maybe is just to slow down and be present, not stressed out when I'm in the car. I'll let you know how it's going. Like the frog, like so many people of peace and grace and generosity that have gone before us, they've chosen a different path. In the world, we will experience angst, anxiety, and scarcity. And yet we are called in all this to be a people, if we follow Jesus, to be set apart, to live totally differently, to look different, to taste different, to live differently with a whole set of different values. It's going to take work though. It takes slowing down, being conscious, rejecting the ways of the world and choosing some ways that we can live differently as people that are really a part of this generous, abundant kingdom of God. I encourage you during Lent to continue, continue um, reading the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Lent, after all, is a journey of being aware of what holds us back, which feels oppressive, what is not life-giving, so that as we head into this Easter season, there is new space for things that are life-giving, for things that taste like joy and smell like love, right? And abundance. Create more space for the things of God in your life this Lent. And know that we are all on this journey together. Thank you, Jill, for that wonderful sermon. I now invite us all to bow our heads for a time of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Loving God, today on this beautiful Sunday or any day during the week when we might be turning to you, we are mindful of your command not to worry. We worry about so many different things. We worry about the food that we're going to eat, the clothes that we're going to wear. We worry about the homes that we live in. And yet you repeatedly tell us, do not worry. So help us to put our troubled hearts at rest so we might open ourselves to your grace and your mercy. Oh God, you also teach us teach us not to judge one another. We often hold each other in such contempt when really what you desire is that we would love one another. 
So we ask that you help us to melt our cold hearts and help us to move to a place of warmth and grace and mercy. Oh God, today we are mindful of everybody who has the COVID virus. We are mindful of all those who are hospitalized and yes, those who have passed away. We ask that you be with families that are grieving today. Oh God, we pray for an end of the COVID virus. We pray that the vaccinations might roll out until the entire nation, yes, even the entire world is vaccinated. Oh God, you have been so faithful with us. You have walked with us through this past year and you promised to walk with us into the future. So open our hearts, O oh God, as we now pray the prayer that your son taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth that is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I now want you to prepare yourself to hear a beautiful song by uh, Joe and the musicians. You know, this is a song about healing. You know, where there's so much brokenness in our lives. Where do we find a sense of healing and wholeness? Well, the song is a beautiful message about we find healing and wholeness in the middle of the presence of God. So I ask that you now enjoy this beautiful piece. shadows deepen we do but do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all we do it's all Creation groaning it is. is a new creation coming it is. is the glory of the Lord light within our midst it is. is it good that we remind ourselves of Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah conquered the grave. He's David's root and the Lamb died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Blessing and honor and glory is he worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves. Does our God intend to dwell again in us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone Seal and open the scroll. The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root, and the Lamb died to ransom the slave. For every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. 
Joe, thank you for that piece. The music has just been beautiful today. And so thank you for um, picking such beautiful pieces. So as we close, let me re-say these words again that stand out in Matthew 6. It's a reminder, right, of this invitation to kingdom living. And so friends, do not consume yourselves with what will you eat, what will you drink? What will you wear? Everyone in this world seems to make themselves frantic over such questions. Don't they realize that our creator knows exactly what they need? And so seek first the kingdom of God in God's right way. And then all these things will be given to you. Do not worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself. Living faithfully is lar a large enough task for today. In all of this, know that the kingdom of God is around us, this gracious, abundant kingdom overflowing with compassion and love. And this kingdom also resides in you. The spirit of God, the spirit of life and love is within you. And so go forth knowing that you hold a treasure of goodness, of greatness, of love within you. And that is enough to change the world. We now have a choral benediction and blessing. Um, so let us just soak in those words as we go out into our week. Thanks again for being with us. Oh.